Hello and welcome to Pixel This 30, where you will see films made with the world famous Pixel 2000 toy video camera ooh, ooh. that records on an audio cassette. Look at that. Audio cassette, picture and sound. The co-director of this festival, Bruno, is just happens to be inside this box right there. Bruno, say something. Thank you so much, Jerry, for introducing me. I love you, Jerry. I love this Pixel Fest. And Bruno, how many dots are there in Pixel? Well, as I was saying, Jerry, there are only 200 dots per frame in a Pixel camera, when in most regular cameras that we use nowadays, there are 200,000. Can you imagine that 200 versus 200,000? That's a lot less pixels than normal. But you know what? We still love the Pixel camera. That's why we're gonna try to make it 100 years. We're at 31. No, we're at 30. Is this 30? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I thought it was 31. <laughs> 30 years going strong, no budget film festival. We were even mentioned in the New York Times once and they called us a small film festival. Boy, did that touch our hearts deeply. So remember to put your mask on. I've got mine right here. Look at, I'm gonna make sure I spell pixel right there. That's really hard to do, but you know, you have to put your mask on. And if you don't have one of those, put one of these kind of masks on. Shoot some green screen. I'll be right back. Whoa, 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 whoa. You, you can really do some wild things with green screen. Whoa, there's some more pixel footage. Look at that. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now that's whoa. some lo fi high jinx. And so we want you to silence your cell phones because airplane noise will drown out calls from other important people. And we're generously supported by no one. But if you're so inclined and you really want to drop some big bucks, you can send us money through Venmo, PayPal, Cash App, Zelle, Patreon, and Patreon. You can Patreon me and Patreon me. No, you can't, you can't send us any money. We don't know what money is and we don't make money. <laughs> Enter Pixel This 31 in 2021. We'll be remaking Stanley Kubrick's 2001 and we're calling it 3001 a pixel oddity. Join us then. The projectionist will now hit play and show you the entire festival. Pixel this 30. Roll them, Fern Doc. Me. How you doing? I'm feeling a little blue. I'm feeling a blue wave. You too? I'm in a state of blue. Who knew? Dodger blue. Did you? I voted blue. I I expected that today, November 19th. It's November 9th. No, November 9th. It's yeah. November 9th and it's broad daylight. Oh, broad is sexist. It is? Yeah, a lot has changed in the last four years. Where are you? I'm in 2020. Oh, I'm not. No, you're in 2016. It was still strange for me. That is strange. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm here. 2016. And you're there? I'm in 2020. Well, yeah. It's November 9th. November 9th, yeah. And what time you got? Uh, I don't know, 11 a.m. or 12 a.m. It's so and dark, you know, it's still really No, dark. it's light out. No, I mean daylight. politically dark. I mean, uh, it's just, what are you okay, talking just about? Just let me explain. Last night I voted and thought that I would see Aww. a new president whose name would be Kamala Hillary. Oh, I thought you were going to say Kamala Harris. <laughs> what is going on? I mean, as of today... There is all, it's it just nothing adds up. So, so all my life, mm -hmm. I thought democracy was pick, you vote. If your candidate gets more votes, you win. Yeah, but not in 2000 and not in 2016. Yeah. The Electoral College. 
So explain that to me. To quote Lurch, uh, I think that I'm confused. Uh, it used to be that I used uh, to think that democracy was the vote of he or she or me. But now I guess I'm wrong. Uh, we need a brand new song. Uh, maybe democracy doesn't work. Oh, no, no, hold I on. I guess Wait. maybe for long. No, come on now. Anyhow, look it. What? If a president was like a flat out racist what would you do i would vote i would volunteer i would watch trevor noah and john oliver adam schiff and Whoa. what would you do i suppose i would think about moving to france ho, ho, ho. If, if, a, if a president built a gigantic 40 foot wall yeah. between one nation and another what would you do i would travel into the future four years to 2020 see if he did it Whoa. see if mexico paid for it you know and then i would laugh at him <laughs> If, what would you do if I sang a song and you sang one with me? I would sing. Try this. This one is, is maybe dedicated to so-called, um, where are you? I'm in 2020. And what time is it? It's Kamala time. Well, as of now, November 9, President Donald Trump is on his way. So who knows, wherever you are. He's still on his way. And whatever time it is. It's Kamala time. Maybe things have changed. Sing this one. Sixteen, <laughs> hiding out in 2020. You have no idea what's coming. So there I was, minding my own business, when suddenly Nicole decides to go out and protest 5G. So what did I do? I grabbed my camera equipment to follow, and what I captured was shocking. Nicole was protesting all over our neighborhood. Stop 5G! Save my family! And they don't have a permit! Denied. And they don't have insurance! Denied. And I felt the neighborhood needed to get the other side of the scoop. The speeds are blazing fast. The 5G scoop, that is. 5G speeds are blazing fast. 5G speeds are great. Stop 5G! I like 5G. Stop 5G! Save my people! I promote 5G. And that's why I decided to tell them about why 5G is the best and fastest internet you've ever seen. Well, I haven't used it, but I use 4G a lot. 5G is blazing fast. Look out, that was just a 5G wave. It's blazing fast. People who use cell phones have brain damage. Their capacity for reason thinking is impaired. Not to mention insomnia, headaches, dizziness, nausea, joint pain, brain fog. I used to be a lover of 5G. You know, I play video games all the time and the speeds are just blazing fast. But I had this dream and it was an epiphany. And I realized 5G is terrible and it's going to be the destruction of all of us if we can't stop it. That is absolutely true. Oh, God. Why did I say those terrible things about 5G? I like 5G. Why? I promote 5G. I have to save the world from 5G. What in the court? This is the case of Maya Sita versus 5G. What is your case, Maya? Why are you against 5G? Maya, do you have any objections to 5G? Well, I'm against it because it gives me a headache. It makes me dizzy. I get vertigo when I stand up. Whoa, 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 don't let me stand up. But it's not just 5G. It's 4G, it's 3G, it's 2G, it's 1G. It's all the Gs. It's unsafe at any speed. It's 
Oh, I'm in quicksand of 5G land. I am nothing. Look inside my brain where the 5G waves roam. 5G is here. I can feel it. I can feel it. Can when feel they started it. the COVID crisis, that's when I started feeling this, this sort of tingling in my arms or burning. I can feel it. Help. I'm choking. Deadly or just blazing fast? Wow, that thing was fast. 5G fast. It was electricity. It was some big electricity. People who use cell phones are subject to diseases that appear to attack them for no reason. Cancer, heart disease, diabetes, strokes, seizure. Not to mention insomnia, headaches, dizziness, nausea, joint pains, brain fog, memory loss, skin rashes, and internal bleeding. They blame bacteria and viruses and view the natural world as an enemy instead of a friend. This is the root cause of the coronavirus madness. Did you know what the level of radiation is in the forest without any cell phone towers? Zero. Maya, who's going to save the bees? Mommy. How are we going to save? Go to the fountain, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mini, yeah, ah, 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 Oh, yeah. Mini, yeah, Tuna fish. Do you make a wish? What do you wish for when you throw the money in? To save the bees? I finally decided to leave when the booze ran out. Last set of gloves. Ventilator pods two months past their use cycle. I haven't opened this door in a week. It's weird seeing everyone's cars lining the street as if they were home. But you leave your car when you catch a ride in the plague wagon. And my father is just sitting there watching me. He says, where are you going to go, son? There's scoots and bulldozers there. Walter Mashir would come in. You don't know what you're going to do. Look, you're leaving everything behind. I say, yes, this is it. I'm going to go. At night time, I left. Transport. Someone with the juice to get out. Running, like me. Only they've got longer legs. New Zealand. 
Maybe that's crazy. Maybe not. Look what I'm pinning my hopes on. If I started to make myself plans, I'm going to have to get across the river and get across to Romania. I just took a, a small suitcase. I spent some time there looking around how to cross the river. Uh, I thought I'll be able to make it alone, but there were the police, they, they called it gendarme on one side, and I started to contact smugglers. One side starts barking, so the other side starts barking, and then the police, all of a sudden, you hear fire and shots. So I was in the middle of the river. I had my suitcase up on my head, and I said to myself, I'm going to go. They had my money there on the way. I'm going to go. And I crossed the river. There were rumors. Before they took Beth and Angie, backyard chatter. When folks still went in their backyards, they said, if you got across the river, you could get ahead of it. Nothing special about that land, just hardly anyone around. Nobody infecting the air. Not supposed to stay. It's just a stopping point on a trail to the ocean. Some survivalist had planted a garden before this all went down. Vegetables, healing herbs. You make it across the river, get to the garden, then you're safe. Rest and provision. Then a long walk while you detox. Get to the salt air where the disease hasn't been able to take hold. Whole new communities of survivors being built there, right on the sand. At least, that's what they said. The whispering voices on the other side of the fences. The big voices, the ones out the loudspeakers, broadcasting every night. They said it wasn't true. They said being safe meant staying put. Stay in your zone. Don't break curfew. Don't talk to your neighbors. That's how it spreads. I thought we should make a run for it. I said that two months ago. Beth said, no, we couldn't risk Angie. What if she couldn't make it across the river? She was just a kid, hadn't learned to swim. Well, now it's just me. They left me alone. So either I lay down or I go see. Well, being I was in the bitar, so in the bitar, and it was Eric Jabotinsky, he was organizing that. Of course, we got all the Betarim. Uh, we're on the boat, we're getting on the boat, and this is how I was accepted. I said I was a Betari coming. But this was one of the one of the biggest illegal aliyah, aliyah bit in, in the history of Zionism. We passed the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus with the ship. Finally, when we came to the international waters, two British destroyers were waiting for us. Vultures. I'm not sticking around long enough for your dinner. That tree line. That's the river. Just need to get over this fence. Ah. Shit. Knee popped out. Shit. I'm a dead man for sure. Know what you need knees for? Everything. Can't even crawl on my hands and knees. Can't swim a river. This is the end.
Carlitos. talk about And sometimes it's hard to know what to say But it's worth it to hear your voice say my name once a day And thank God for Bluetooth headphones I can do my dishes while you complain That whatever is frustrating you today I really don't mind, it's all part of the game The game of telephone Telephone Doesn't really matter what we say mm, End of the day Telephone Far apart but not alone Doesn't really matter what we say Jumbles together anyway As long as we make time to call It's not so bad at all I'm so glad I got to visit you I can visualize what you're talking about Like the cactus in the window facing south how I love to hear those things fall out your mouth On the telephone Telephone I never feel lonely or ignored Cause I know you're on board Play a game of telephone Far apart but not alone It doesn't really matter what we say we Jumbles together anyway As long as we make time to call It's not so bad at all For some reason I can tell for some reason I can tell For some reason I can tell That you're awake right now
Perhaps it's because 
much time having fun. Being back in my own way, I sit on the shelf in my own way. I'm ashamed of myself. There's a mantra. I'm always silent behind.
even tip, even tip him because he'll be dead.
You know, this instrument is like external lungs. It breathes against your body. Sometimes they smell a little funny. So Mockingbird, we were talking about uh, trolls, hater. That, that's a fantastic new word, haters. And then they're also called orcs from the Hobbit books. And there's a famous uh, operation done by these agencies called Mockingbird. I'm not sure why it's, what it has to do with Mockingbirds. Mockingbirds like repeat things they hear in rooms unexpectedly, but it was, there's a famous case where this woman uh, who was one of JFK's lovers was assassinated. Her husband was head of mockingbird operations in Europe. And there's a famous case there of uh, the Paris Review with George Plimpton and these two other guys were one of them right out of Yale. Yale is a big place for recruiting people into these agencies. And this is in the early 50s when it was all completely wonderful and considered very appropriate. And it's, but today Mockingbird is going on again with, uh, it's very bizarre. There's this, uh, the anti-psychedelic psychedelicists. There's a group of psychedelic researchers who think, uh, and referring to uh, the other story about H.G. Wells, that, that um, the British invasion of 19, in, in World War II, the Gerald Herrod and Aldous Huxley and Gregory Bateson and, and this crew came over here. They were very English, super English. And Bateson even worked for the OSS in Asia in World War II, designing propaganda with Margaret Mead, you know, specifically tailored to each culture in Korea and China and Japan and all these islands over there. And so it, that's what it is. Mockingbird is what today is called fake news. You hear it with the alt-right movement that got involved in politics recently where, um, well, we actually the the traditional mockingbird is where they infiltrate the academic world, the newspaper publishing, magazines and books, and just flood it with whatever propaganda they think is appropriate. Uh, in the United States, has been quite damaging to the uh, democracy movement, and there was this huge post World War II um, democracy. See, like. The Germans, we had lots of Germans prisoners in U.S. prisoner of war camps, but they were run like the American high schools to train the Germans how to be practicing democracy our way, not, you know, the Nazi way. They were, you know, they were trying to keep Hitlerism from coming back. 
and so that you know they taught them civics you know American high school civics but that was all totally eliminated by the anti-communism movement with uh, President Truman and uh, you know the anti-Hollywood you know the the, the the McCarthy hearings they were called complete and actually Margaret Mead was and Bateson were actually that's one of the things they did um, this, this, after World War II anyway this is where they got the idea the CIA is behind everything everybody was in the OSS if they weren't in the army in World War II there wasn't anybody not in the war effort so after the war since they were you know they ran prisoner of war camps you know training in democracy so Margaret Mead you know that's what they did after the war so it seemed like there was a good thing to be doing, but it there's a guy at, at Stanford named Fred Turner who's written a fantastic book about this. It just came out like two years ago about democracy and how, well, what it, the, what's behind this is the counterculture that happened in the 60s it was already happening in the 52, and it was totally squashed by this anti-communist hysteria, very similar to how the anti-terrorism thing is, you know, it's just continuing to postpone implementing democracy and the counterculture, you know, another 20 years. So, Mockingbird is the key word. We'll get back to that next time. This song's called Corona V and the need for TP chip. Haven't had a bowel movement, feeling kinda weak. Maybe it's the pressure of trying not to freak. Energy in the air is awful mighty weird. This global freaking pandemic has got everyone in fear. We should all unite and pray for luck. But try and take my TP and I'm gonna fuck you up. Corona V, Corona V, Corona V, and the need for TP. Corona V, COVID-19, Corona V, and the need for TP. Self-isolation, the new phrase. To get this virus, you're quarantined for days. Don't touch your freaking face, you'll infect your pores. Wear a goddamn mask or the death count soars. Social distancing, the new norm. Try to take my hand, Sandy, and you wish you weren't born. Corona V, Corona V, COVID-19. Corona V and the need for TP. It's hard to fathom this new world we're in. Can't get drunk in bars, can't go out and sin. Praying to Jesus, this shit will end. Get back to partying, get laid again. Some people out there seem hardly phased. But try and take my TP, your ass is getting tased. Corona V, COVID-19. Corona V and the need for TP. I do not like drink. I do not like sodomy. Don't care what you think. Don't care what you thought of me. But I have to admit, though you might think it odd of me, I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Right now I'm trying to document the necessity to uh, facilitate my uh, stage in life where I'm educating or teaching and the only thing I really possess that I thinks of any value is spiritual knowledge. So the little bit that I 
feel that I can convey to the world is that of the Messiah, Yahshua, or better known as Jesus the Christ, and uh, how he saved my soul and redeemed my life with all of its sins. Um, there was a, a man in Key West that I, I met, and he, uh, he helped me understand that the world, the spirit world in particular, is divided into two worlds. One being that of entertaining spirits, which would be unclean spirits, and that of clean spirits, which would be ministering spirits. And so he helped me understand that I had a choice in life. I was either to entertain and be that of the unclean spirits or to minister and be that of the clean spirits. So in my walk, my journey in life, I, I chose to try to minister instead of entertain. So this is my, my step forward in, in doing that in this process. So a conversation we've been having in Venice the last couple days is when we talk about respect and understanding, um, are we talking about tactics or philosophy? Is our resolution not to confront people violently a resolution towards understanding or a sort of uh, approach towards gaming or game theory? Are we actually trying to affect the same end by being slightly more manipulative, which we call respect, or are we actually embodying a philosophy of sort of all truths being equally valid? And this also applies to the question of making art with analog instruments and early digital instruments. We can never really determine whether it's the sensual pleasure of the analog uh, or early digital instruments 
and all their sort of unexpected quirks, like the result of feedback when you point a lens at a video screen, or whether the instruments themselves are the most expedient approach to creating a certain uh, type of situation. shadowing, premonitions, dreams. He haunts, he stalks, dark, divine trickster, many faces, familiar places. I recognize him each and every time. The smell may be disparate, the look might be different, but the feel is certainly not. The hunger doesn't change in its ferocity, but my relationship to it does. Feed me, vampire, but do not devour me. I won't allow it. My appetite is no longer for the physical. My primal yearns and lust for the metaphysical. Mm. I've made myself sick before off blood and bones. Poison offers no promises. Old corridors, cold marble floors. I will not frolic barefoot on the atrium of his ghosts because I've turned my own demonic energies to be welcomed. When acting from these places, these open, gushing wounds with the masked persona of the Joker, one is not in their sovereignty. They are in their trauma. The schemes of hell are savory and seductive, plunging into the depths of reenactments floods one's brain with euphoria, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine rush, an infatuation crush begins. Original sin separated from the obedience of creator, filling voids with an appetite for hedonism. But can God be met in hedonism? When the apple is no longer the object of curiosity, but the one who carved it, he who shaped it, his imagination perplexes. 
unpredictable and fully capable mesmerizing language it's his palace I wish to have poured upon me full of the blood of Jesus help me please God to desire you more powerfully than I have desired carnal men because if I falter I become possessed Obsession takes over, the addict awakens, and the object worth living for becomes my next fix. My ego can't hold the flooding which then ensues. A madwoman, feral, insatiable. I know being drenched in his pheromones is nothing like being drenched by the Holy Spirit. This is the hand that shook the hand of the king. And there is only one king, and you will find out about that shortly. In April 1969, I was working as a movie extra. I was uh, a junior in high school, and I got a call to come to Universal Pictures for uh, an interview. It's not literally an interview, it's more like a lineup. And you would line up, and the casting director would look at you and pick out the extras that he wanted. So I checked Variety before going over, and I already knew that it was going to be a feature, so I skipped the TV shows, and there were three features that they were making at Universal. One was Topaz, an Alfred Hitchcock movie. The other one was Two Meals for Sister Sarah, which was with Clint Eastwood and Shirley MacLaine and directed by Don Siegel. And the third was Change of Habit with Elvis Presley. And I thought, wow, any of them would be great to be on. So I went there, went for the interview, which was basically a lineup. The casting director sent three people, and I was there were down to three other people, myself and two other guys, and then the director came and made the final choice. The director was William Graham. And he said, okay, you, you're the one, kid. And at this point, a door opened up, and Elvis Presley walked in wearing a white smock. And he had just changed his hairstyle from the greasy look to the dry look if you remember that po the popularity of that hairstyle back in those days. And he had sideburns. So the next week I reported for work, and um, the assistant director, who, whose name was Phil Bowles, he was also the assistant director on Touch of Evil. The cameraman was Russell Mitty, by the way, who was also the cameraman on Touch of Evil. He said, okay, you and these two other guys are going to be part of Elvis's crew. You're playing Puerto Ricans, except for this one guy who was a black guy, and you were gangbangers, and now you're good guys, and you do what Elvis tells you. So he brought us over to Elvis's trailer, and he said, Elvis, these three kids are going to be working with you in the picture for a couple of weeks. And he introduced us, and Elvis shook our hands. This was the hand that shook the hand of the king. I ended up working on the picture for four weeks, made a lot of money, back in those days, enough to see me through actually my first semester of college, which I went to a year and a half later. So um, mainly working with Elvis was observing what happened, and he always had a group 
of friends from Memphis with him. They were always hanging around in the Memphis Mafia, I think they were called. And there were a lot of um, Latina extras working on this, and so they were always trying to hit on these girls. And say, I'm gonna get, we, you can come back to Elvis's suite tonight at the Beverly Hills Hotel. We're going to have a big party. I overheard these kind of conversations. And I also noted that Elvis was smoking a certain kind of cigar. And I was interested in that. And one day I went up to him and uh, I said, Elvis, what kind of cigars uh, are, uh, do you smoke? He said, those are Villager Kyle's. They're good, real good. I said, well, where do you get them? He said, well, you get them at the B&G tobacco shop on Sunset. Tell them Elvis sent you. And I said, okay. So the next weekend, I went with a couple of friends of mine to the B&G tobacco shop on Sunset Boulevard. And it was on the westernmost end of Sunset. We went in, and I went up to the guy at the counter, and in those days they were not very strict about checking ID. You could get away with the, these kind of things. Uh, you could get away with going into uh, what were called, not R-rated movies, but adult-only movies, not pornographic movies, but adult-only, they, they were not very good about checking ID. So I went in there with a couple of friends of mine, and I said, I'd like, um, I'd like a uh, Villager Kyle. And he said, oh, you, a box? And I said, how much is a box? $25. Of course, that was big money. And then I said, no, I, I don't know. I just want a, just a single cigar. And he said, okay. And, and, I, and he said, you know who smokes these? And I said, yeah, Elvis Presley. He said, oh, really? And he said, yeah, he told me to come here. He said, well, son, here are two cigars. So I got one. I paid for one, which is, I believe, was like a dollar which was big money in those days, and I got one free. I went, left with my friends, and we smoked both of them over the weekend, and then the next Monday I was back at work, and I went up to Elvis, and I said, oh, by the way, I went to the B&G, and I, I got um, a Villager Kyle. And he said, what did you think of it? And I said, that was a good smoke, Elvis. And he said, well, how many did you get? And I said, well, two. And I said, oh, two? Hang on a moment. He went back to his trailer and gave me a box. My second protracted interaction with Elvis was the day after the Academy Awards. And this, this was April of 69, so the awards were given out for movies that had come out in 1968. So we were on this set that represented a, um, a flat where the, some of the er other characters were staying and Elvis's crew was painting the flat as a favor to them. So I'm standing next to Elvis and they're getting ready to start the shot. And Elvis, by the way, never had a guy stand in for him when the lighting cameraman was lighting the set. He went and did it himself. So that's why he was standing there. Usually, you know, other big actors, they don't want to stand under the lights, but Elvis didn't give a shit. So there we were standing next to each other. And he said, you watch the Oscar show last night? And I said, yeah. And he said, weren't those numbers piss poor? You think it's Hollywood? You think they could do better than that? I said, yeah, I guess so. And he said, and what did you think about 2001 losing? I said, I couldn't believe this. Me either. Man, they must have their heads up their asses there. And those were my two prolonged interactions with Elvis Presley. Although I did see him, he did. We had this all-night shoot where you would go in at 6 p.m., you'd finish at 6 a.m., and this was on the back lot on their New York Street. And this New York Street was still called the Abbott and Costello Street because in the 50s, about 10 years earlier, they used to shoot the Abbott and Costello show there, but it was basically a New York tenement street. And there was a street festival, and they had a stage set up, and some local band within the context of the movie is, was going to be performing for a scene in the movie. So for this all-night shoot, which a number, of event, where a number of scenes took place during this all-night shoot, but it started with the, this band playing on the stage. So they got up on the stage and they did a couple of takes and then they called lunch even if it's in the middle of the night everything was you know breakfast lunch and dinner so the last meal of the morning was dinner but the meal in the middle of the night was lunch called lunch we all broke for lunch came back and Elvis got up on the stage and for 20 minutes we got a free solo concert he just had a guitar that was plugged in and did a 20 minute concert for all of the crew that was the other, I mean, there were a lot of high points on the movie, but these were the Elvis high points of the story. 
And basically, this was the hand that shook the hand of the king, and that's it. Everyone's always talking about cognitive dissonance. Why are they doing that? 
It's because they're experiencing cognitive difference distances distance between minds. It's a union between consciousnesses. Why do we stand for what we say we do? Subsequently, we realize that we're no more fact or fiction than those people. <laughs> oh, take one. This is a song I wrote a gazillion years ago called Just Happy to Be Me.
A tutor who tutored the flute tried to tutor us to tutor us to toot. Said the two to the tutor, is it harder to toot or to tutor to tutors to toot? Ah, oh, put a hurtin' on it, wrestling poodles.
You're sure it's rolling right here at the Fielka Funny Farm Films, our first production. Cameras shape behavior. Ooh. By Susie and Jerry. Oh, mostly Jerry. CSB, laughters.com. So it's a real honor and a pleasure to have you here in our first film. We welcome your input. How do cameras shape your behavior? Woo! So there's a whole history of cameras. Here, right here, we're going to really fast tell you that the word camera, 1708, is rooted in Latin for vaulted room, anything with an arch cover, a dark chamber or a light chamber. So look at this camera. Wow, that's Ooh. old. That probably collapses. But that is a beaut, isn't it? He's a you beauty. Can shoot. Oh, that's and look old. at this camera. Uh, Ow, got me. Help. Look at this camera. Wow. Oh, that's just a beautiful a noise it makes. Look at you can shoot cameras with you can shoot pictures with cameras. And then look at the style Jeez, and the architecture gorgeous. in that box camera. And then you got the flash camera. Flash! And then you got all these sophisticated 35 millimeter oh, cameras. Yeah. Look at those. Olympus, you can really you're gonna just climb mountains with these cameras. Mountains. But then you can just shoot your home family shots with these little 10 cent plastic click and it matches your outfit and it matches my outfit but say you oh say you want to be sophisticated and use current tools like a cell phone what oh my god shooting this no not with that cell phone help Look at that. Whoa. help and you could shoot film with a 16 millimeter camera and be a That's not a real film. camera. Oh. And then you could be even less sophisticated and shoot it with a Super oh, 8 camera. That. Look at that Super Gorgeous. 8. Wow, that's home movies at its best. Woo, woo. Woo, home and movies. Then you can get really sophisticated and get playful and shoot with a toy camera, a Pixel Vision toy camera. Wow. But then. Hey, that's too sophisticated. I want to shoot with a real toy camera. Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. And it's been an honor and a pleasure having you here at our first film. But now we're going to show you how do cameras shape your behavior. Look at that little child. Oh, that's Be great. playful. And remember, Back tell to us how cameras shape your behavior. Hey,